Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here to make another video on YouTube to help you improve your chess game. Today I thought I'd talk about tempos. Tempos in chess are the time it takes to make one move. Now there's a little bit of a confusion sometimes between the word tempo and the word move and the word ply, and they are related. So let's quick define them before we start talking about them. If white plays e4 and black plays e5, that's the first move of the game. We've just seen one move. Each player has moved once, but we call that the first move of the game. And sure, there's two things that have happened. They've each made that move. So we call that a ply. So if the computer's looking ahead and he sees e4 and e5, he's looking one move ahead but he's looking to ply ahead. So even though we say both players have moved, a move is considered both players making the move together. That's the first move of the game, and it takes to ply. But if we measure in terms of the time it takes to make the move, I don't mean the time on the clock, but the amount of number of moves it takes you to do something, we talk about tempo. So for instance, white can use the first tempo of the game, the first move, to play e4. Suppose white wants to lose a tempo. Suppose you're white and you'd like to play black and you say, wow, I like to play e5 against e4. I love it when I'm black and someone plays e4 and I play e5. And you want to play black and you want to lose a tempo. You could play e3 on the first move with the idea that, boy, if my opponent plays e5, I can now play e4 and I've lost the tempo because it took me two moves to play e4 instead of one move and therefore it's now black's turn and it's just as if black has had has the white pieces in a normal game and here we could get for instance a Roy Lopez with knight f6 knight c3 bishop to b4 where all the colors are reversed and everything is happening exactly as it would in a normal game except that by white losing the tempo, he's reversed the colors. So again, e3, e5, e4 gets to the same position as e4, e5, but, but it's black's turn instead of white's because white has lost a tempo by taking two moves to make that pawn up to e4 as opposed to only doing one. Okay, hopefully understand now, you know, if the computer's looking seven ply ahead, that's three and a half moves ahead. And we're now gonna talk about tempos. Okay, so one of the most common terms that we hear all the time is that move loses a tempo. And a lot of times it doesn't really mean you're losing a tempo, it really means that you're kind of wasting time that you could be doing with something else. So let's give a good example of that. Let's say uh, black plays the uh, elephant gambit here, knight f3, d5. All right, so here black is threatening to win the pawn on e4. White could capture the pawn on e5, but the better move is to take the pawn, e takes d5, and now the main book move is to play e4 and hit the knight. But let's say black doesn't do that. And, I, and if you watched my videos where I play out loud against the mid-level engine, the mid-level engine sometimes plays queen takes d5 here, which is an inferior move. Why is it inferior? Well, it's because white wants to bring out his pieces anyway, so he's going to take this knight on b1 that's not doing anything, and he's going to bring it to c3, which is a better square. It attacks the central squares, but also it attacks the queen. Now, when you attack something with something worth less, I call this AWL, and if you haven't seen my video on AWL, it's a really good video. I, I highly recommend it, if no for no other reason than... You know, I, that's a concept that I see all the time, and yet no one has ever given it a name. So I decided giving it the name AWL was really important because it comes up so often in chess. And here we're doing an AWL. We're attacking the queen with the knight, but we're doing more than just AWLing. We're developing a piece to the square we normally want to have anyway, and the piece that we're hitting is in a very nice square and he would like to stay there but he can't because he's being attacked so therefore he has to move the piece and after he moves the queen let's say queen to a5 it cost him an extra tempo that is it took him two moves instead of one to keep the queen out there safely and meanwhile white got an extra knight out 
So white has one more move for development than he normally would have because black had to spend an extra move. And when this happens, when you develop a piece from a square where it's not doing much to a square where it would like to go, and your opponent has to make a move where he can't bring out another piece, he has to spend time doing something else, that we call winning a tempo. So in this case, if you AWL someone with a developing move and it costs them time, a tempo, to make another move where they could otherwise be developing, then you've gained one move in development, which we call winning a tempo. Now, are all AWLs winning a tempo? No, there's lots of examples of AWLs that don't win a tempo. Let's do one right now. Let's say black plays queen to c5. And now let's say we AWL the queen again with knight to a4. You might say, oh, well, the knight's attacking the queen again. That's winning a tempo again because the queen has to move and you win another tempo. No, because what's happening here is the queen is on an okay square and we're attacking the queen, but he can go to another okay square and what the knight's doing is actually going to an inferior square. The knight's not developing himself. He's almost undeveloping himself by putting himself on the rim there. So for instance, if black plays queen to a5 now, yes, it costs black a tempo to do that, but it also costs white a tempo to attack the queen, and that knight is not being developed. It's not bringing an extra piece out. It's actually putting the knight on a worse square. So you could almost think of this as losing a tempo because black's going to take one tempo to save the queen, and now white's taking one tempo to attack the queen, and then he's going to have to take another tempo to save the knight and bring it back in the game, or even if he guards it with b3, at some point this knight on a4 is not a very good knight. So he's gonna have to take time to get back in the game. So white is not only not winning a tempo, we could argue that he's losing a tempo, but in any case, we would all agree he's not gaining a tempo when he plays knight a4. Knight a4, is that an AWL? Absolutely. AWL means attack with something worth less. Well, knight's worth less than the queen. Is that a threat? It absolutely is. If black doesn't do anything, white will take the queen and trade a knight for a queen. So that's a pretty big threat, but it's also a pretty bad move. So a lot of beginners like to make these bad threats. They make threats where they spend a tempo making a move, figuring, well, I'll attack my opponent and, you know, let's see how he guards the threat or how he defends the threat. But if your opponent has a very good move to defend the threat and it's kind of like a silly threat, then you're not winning a tempo at all. But I, I, when I go over games with my students, especially ones that haven't you know, played a lot of chess or haven't played in tournaments, and they just are kind of casual players, and they make moves like this, they say, oh, I'm winning a tempo. And I'm like, well, no, you're not really winning a tempo here. So this is not winning a tempo. Now, I've also said in the past that even though we call this winning a tempo, and in a sense, it is winning a tempo. It's not the same thing as actually the first example I gave. Here, when white plays e3 and black plays e5 and we play e4, this is a pure tempo play. White has purely lost this tempo to get to this position. And you see this in the end game a lot when we have triangulation. I'll show that example in a little bit. But this is the pure winning and losing a tempo right here. When you win a tempo with the knight c3 move, Let's go back to that again. Go back to e4, e5, knight f3, d5, e takes d5, queen takes d5, knight c3. We're not literally winning the tempo like we, we did when we wait, like black won a tempo and white wasted a move going here. It's just that you make better efficient moves of your moves. Here black is making a very inefficient move. He has to move the queen again. So we're not literally getting to the same position one tempo ahead. We're just getting to a position where white has an extra tempo for development. And those two ideas are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. All right, let's look at another example of not winning a tempo when you're AWLing something. And this happens all the time in like when people play, let's say they play the London. D4, D5, Bishop F4, Knight F6, Knight F3 e6, sorry, e6, e3, let's say white plays, um, black plays bishop e7, h3, c5, c3, castle, bishop d3. 
All right, so some of my students in positions like this play a mode like C4. C4, and when I ask them why did they play C4, they say, oh, I wanted to win a tempo. They, when I ask them, are you really thinking that he's not going to move the bishop and you're going to win it, they say, well, no, of course not. But they say, I want to win a tempo. And I say, well, how are you winning a tempo? They say, well, I'm forcing the bishop to move again. And then I say, well, how many times did you have to move that pawn on C5 to get that bishop to move? And they say, well, one, you mean once it's on C5? And I say, yeah. And they say, well, I had to move the pawn once. And I say, okay. And then how many times does he have to move to save the bishop? And they say, once. And I say, well, how are you winning a tempo? I said, it costs him a tempo. To, it takes you, costs you a tempo to attack the bishop. It costs him a tempo to save the bishop. Where's the tempo that you gain? See here, the, the pawn on c5 is already in the game. He's attacking this key central square d4 and putting the pressure on the white pawn. And by doing that, he has a good role in the opening. Once he goes to c4, he's not more in the game than he was on c5. It's not like when you develop the knight and you hit the queen. That's a whole different concept. Here, the pawn was already doing something, and you could argue, well, now he has more space. Well, maybe, but he has less pressure on the center, and there's also another problem with this. By taking the pressure off d4, it makes it easier for white to play e4 later without worrying that he could lose the d-pawn, and also it blocks black's play on the, the center so that he has to play on the queen side and play for this b4 break and there's not a lot of targets over there on b2 and a2 for black to shoot for but white can play on the center and the king side with e4 and move his pieces toward the king side and white's play here is much much easier and stronger than black's play so if we ask the engine let's scroll this up here and we'll say Mr. Mr. Engine C, now, there are positions where a move like c4 can be okay. I don't think this is one of them. Most of them they're not. And, you know, chess is a fun game where, you know, if 8 times out of 10 a move like c4 here is really bad, that doesn't mean it's bad 10 out of 10 similar situations. But I think in this situation c4 is not going to make our top move. Let's see here. Stockfish says black has nothing better. All right, so he's going to make a little liar out of me and say, in this position, c4 isn't as bad as it normally is. And I'm sure if I change the position a little, I could make c4 a bad move. So here Stockfish is saying, c4, Dan, yeah, it's, you know, fighting up there for number one. Right now it's got a very slight lead of like seven hundredths of a pawn over b6. I wouldn't play c4 here. And as I said earlier, I don't think it's the best move. I think if Stockfish looked further and further and further, it wouldn't be number one. But it's not that bad. And clearly, if Stockfish thinks it's number one at 24, 25 ply, even by a small amount, it can't be a really bad move. But one thing it's not, and that's why it's in this video, is it's not winning a tempo. It does gain a little space. It does attack the bishop. It's definitely an AWL move. No doubt about that. See, the, winning a tempo is a little bit subjective. I don't think it's completely subjective, but AWL is never subjective. Either you're attacking something with something worth less or you're not. If you move a pawn up here and the pawn is worth less than the bishop and the pawn can take the bishop on the next move, that's an AWL. There's no doubt about it. Whether it's a good move or not, whether it's winning a tempo or not, well, those things are a little more subjective. So I wouldn't play C4 here. Oops, I just re unfortunately by moving the pieces back and forth, I reset the... Uh, engine evaluation but the engine says hey Dan it's as good as any other move here and that's interesting that it is because my guess as you could tell from listening to the video is that uh, it wouldn't have been number one move but right now it's up number one by one one hundredth of a pawn at 26 ply and you know as I said I would kind of bet that if the computer looks deeper it's it's not going to stay number one but so far it is and during <laughs> my video isn't long enough to sit here and wait to see if I become correct, but it's a reasonable move for sure in this position. Okay, anyway, it's not winning a tempo. That's the important point. A C4, AWL, not winning a tempo. Let's go into the end game and look at tempos in the end game. Now, one of the use of tempos in the end game is if we're in some sort of race. Let's say I've just come over and I've captured his rook pawn. And I have a rook pawn, and he has a rook pawn, 
and he's just captured my pawn on a6 and now it's white's turn and white's in a race we could count the tempos to see who's going to queen we could say white's going to take you know move the king out of the way let's say you don't want to go to the square he's going to the diagonal he's going to queen on so we don't don't want to go to this diagonal but here we can so white's going to move the king out of the way that's one tempo and then two three four five six black's going to go one two three four five six but it's white's turn and white's going to queen and guard that queening square so white has just enough tempos to win the game here king g6 king b5 h4 a5 even though black gets to move his pawn two and white only got to move his pawn one we counted the tempos and indeed if he tries to queen here we just take it off of course and if he plays let's get that queen back on the board if he plays king b4 we could do the awl move sorry not a, the gts move go to sleep in the end game i have a video on that too go to sleep in the end game. we just put our queen in front of the pawn anytime you put your queen in front of a pawn when you have a queen against the pawn the game is over it's a win you just bring your king up and soups along his king away and that's a good example also if black puts his king over here and says i'm never going to move again i'm just going to guard my pawn forever this is where tempos come into play because you're you have compulsion to move you can't say i'm going to use my tempo to not move at all so it's black's turn it's his move and he has to move away he has to go away from that b3 square and now white plays king c3 and now black has to move away from the pawn he has to use his move his tempo to move lose the pawn and they would go up okay so tempo is very 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 important in the end game here we had to count the tempos if it was black's move then white's the one in trouble because black's going to queen first even though white's pawns on the third rank and black's pawns on the seventh rank because white the white pawn can only move one and the black pawn can move up two if black goes first then white's the one in trouble he can't cat his king's outside the square how do we know well you always have to make the pawn move first before you do the square because otherwise when the pawn moves up two the rule of the square doesn't work so you have to wait till after the pawn moves so we would play king here pawn here now that the pawn has moved we can draw the square and there it is right here rule of the square if you don't know this you can go back to my video king and pawn against king uh, part one and part two where I think part one is where I talk about this and now the king can't move inside the square so even though in this position after king here if we draw this square this is not the right time to draw it because you have to draw it after the pawn moves it looks like the white king can catch him by coming back in now obviously the black king could block him out and keep him away from the pawn anyway but white's desperate he's trying to catch this pawn because he knows that black's going to queen the pawn first if he just races after a5 if he just races after this pawn sorry if he just races with his pawn against the pawn black will queen queen first and then he'll be the one to do the gts to go to sleep in the end game but now when we push the pawn two that's the time to draw the square and he can't get inside the square so now white's lost if he races he loses the race and queen and if white went the other way let's say white goes up this way so let's say black goes here and white goes here to be closer to the queening pawn well again we've got the same problem a5 h4 a5 even though white's king is a lot closer he can't he can't get to guard the promoting square so here that he would love to play king here and guard the square but he can and when he play, brings his king around to try to help the pawn the queen just comes here and again we have that gts go to sleep in the end game idea all right let's take a problem from pandolfini's nice book pandolfini's end game course this is a great book for learning basic end game ideas the only problem with the book is unless they updated the book which bruce says they the publisher wouldn't let him do it has a lot of errors in the book so you have to google pandolfini's end game course errata list and look for the errors in the book it's there's a web page that has all the errors and when you buy the book you fix the book and then you do the book and it's a wonderful book but only if you fix the book by going to the page that fixes all the errors in the book 
Okay, so let's let's pick problem number 105 in his book. Clear out the board. King to d5. King to c8. Pawn on c6. Pawn on a6. Pawn on a5. White to play. Okay, so here, if it's white's move and he tries to directly win the game, he can't do it right away. If he comes up to d6 and black goes to d8, white can't make any direct progress here. If he pushes the pawn, black will go king c8. King c6 is stalemate. If he moves the king anywhere else, he loses the pawn, and then, then black's king simply goes in the corner, and it's an easy draw. If, if white tries to play king c5 first, then black plays king c7, and again, white can't come up. So how does white make progress? Well, white makes progress if he can get back to this exact same kind of position where it's going to be black's move. So what white wants to do is he wants to basically lose a tempo, which would be the same thing as actually kind of gaining a tempo. He just wants to reverse whose move it is. So whether he could kind of gain a tempo and make it black's move or lose a tempo to make it black's move in this kind of position, those two ideas are exactly the same. So we tend to think of it as losing a tempo. And the way to lose a tempo is to triangulate with your king where black can't do the same triangle. So notice white can do a triangle like this waiting to do those moves and black can't do the same kind of triangle because the pawn is blocking the squares. All black, black can do is go up and on, on the side and he doesn't have the same flexibility. Does that actually work? Well, yes it does. Let's say white plays king here, king to d4. Well, if black comes up and plays king to c7, we've now lost the tempo from the line where we went to c5. We can go to c5 in two moves instead of one. We lose that tempo. Just like when the white in the opening of the game, in that first example I gave you played e3 and e4, he lost the tempo and created a position where black was white in the opening. Here, if we go king d4 and he plays king c7 and we play king c5, it's the exact same position as if we had played king c5 right away, except it took us two moves instead of one. So even though it's the same position, it's not dynamically the same because white wants it to be black's move and not his move. If he went there right away and black goes here, it's going to be white's move in that position. But if he goes here and black goes here and white plays here, now black has to go back. Well, normally you go straight back so he can't win with the pawn. But if you go straight back and white plays here, white could even win the second pawn now. So, for instance, uh, king d4, king, if he plays here, we can just take off the pawn. And now black's just lost. If he plays king here, we're not going to stalemate him. You always be careful about stalemates. We can play here. When he plays here, with two pawns, you could do either one. You can push this pawn. And now when he plays here to stop you from queening, you just play here with not with the idea of getting a queen, just the idea of losing a tempo. Here, white wants to just make a move and lose a tempo. The king comes up. The white king comes here, and the c pawn queens. In fact, both pawns would queen. So after king d4, king c7, king c5, king straight back, king here, king here, we could take the pawn. If he comes up over here, we can just guard the pawn. And now with the extra pawn, the win is trivial. Again, if he goes straight back, we come up. He plays here. We come up. He plays here, and again, we lose the tempo. He goes here, and we can bring our king up here and win. Not to mention, we could also push the A pawn. Okay, hopefully you're convinced that if white goes here, and black goes here, and white goes here, that white's now winning. If black goes back diagonally, it's, it's even easier. White doesn't even need to win this pawn anymore. He'll just get a queen here. If black goes here, if we get a queen, it's stalemate. What should you do in a position like this? Well, you could say, I'll get a rook and I'll win. But you really don't need to do that. All you need to do is waste the tempo with your king. Just play something like king c6 or king d8. And then on the next move, you'll get a queen. For instance, king c6, king a8, only legal move. c8, queen is checked now. Can't be a stalemate if it's check. And your queen, checkmate. All right, so king d we've seen over and over again now that this is a win for white. So therefore, when white goes here, black's going to have to go sideways. Let's say he plays king here. 
All right, but now if I, we come back to d5 for white, that's silly because black will play king c8 and get back to the same position we started with, and white has made no progress. If we play king c5, he'll play king c7, and again, we have no progress. This is where you need to triangulate. You need to play king to c4. Okay, now what can black do? Well, if he comes up to c7, we come to c5, and now it's black's turn to move, and he has to give way just like we've already seen. But if he tries to mirror white and play king here, white plays king to d5, and now we've got back to the original position, except white has made three moves in a triangle to get back to that position, and black has only made two moves back and forth, which means white has lost a tempo. That's the whole idea of the video, is you know gaining tempos, losing tempos. Here, you could argue that white actually gained a tempo by making it black's move, because he wanted to change it, Again, most people don't think of it that way because White's the one who took the extra time. So we say, oh, he did the sort of the same thing. He lost the tempo here. And now Black's lost because now if he goes king to d6, White plays king, I'm sorry, king d8, then king d6. And now if king c8, c7, he's squeezed out. King b7, king here, king here. And again, please don't get a queen here and stalemate him. Move your king to c6 or d8, and then get a queen on the next move. Or if you want to get a rook here first, you can do that. But don't get a queen. All right, let's look at that again. King d4, king d8, king c4, king c8, king d5. There's our triangle. Let's say he plays king d c7. Well, we've already looked at this. We had play king here, but now it's black's move, not white's. And when he goes away, we come up here, we win this pawn, and we win the game just like we showed you earlier. So the way to win this game for white is not to come bullying ahead because black goes here. I don't call this getting the opposition. If you want to see why I don't call it getting the opposition, you can watch my video on the use of the term opposition. If you want to call it opposition, be my guest. It's just a, a word, you know, we've, there's no standard dictionary of chess, but I think of this as having the right tempos here. Opposition I reserve for when the king is in front of the pawn. When there's kings next to the pawn, it's a whole different ball game. Anyway, so that's for the other video. So king d8, white, white can't push the pawn here. Let's see. Let's go back. So we just said king here, king here, doesn't work. King here, king here, doesn't work. It's white's move. He has to move away. If he goes here, black goes back here and repeats the position and says, thank you, white. The only way that white can win here, if we go back to the start, is you move your king, threaten to move your king in this triangle. Now, it, you only have to triangulate if the king moves sideways. If the king comes up, then you have gone this kind of triangle, and you didn't even have to complete the triangle, and now when he goes back anywhere, it, if he goes back, straight back, you come up and win the pawn. Okay, so here, the idea for white is to lose the tempo. In openings, you're trying to gain as many tempos as you can. If your opponent, let's say, plays the center counter game, very similar to the elephant gambit that way, and he takes with the queen, then the main move is to play knight c3. Grandmaster Kaufman has said another way to win a tempo in that same opening is to play something like d4, and later on, you can play c4 and actually get your knight behind the pawn and attack your queen, the queen with the pawn. Notice if the queen plays something like queen e4 check, later on we can win another tempo on the queen. So for instance here, I don't necessarily want to play bishop here, although bishop here, queen takes, bishop here is probably okay for white. But what I could do here is just play knight to e2, temporarily block my bishop, and when he tries to develop another piece, I can attack his queen like that. Or, for instance, I see sometimes when beginners play this and white plays knight c3, the beginners play queen e5 check, figuring, well, I'll check him, and that makes him do something. Maybe I can get some time. But actually, that loses more time, because white can play bishop e2, and if black plays some random move, then white can play knight f3, hitting the queen. And here we go again, not only awl, but winning a tempo. And if black plays bishop to g4, 
with the idea that if the knight hits the queen, he could take it and he can't take back with the bishop and you can mess up his pawns, then what white could do is instead he could play d4, which again is a move that we want to play. It's an AWL. It gets a piece out so we can develop the bishop. And again, he's going to have to at some point move the queen here, and then we win more time. We win that tempo again. All right, so hopefully in this video we've talked about what's winning a tempo, maybe what's not winning a tempo. We've talked about losing a tempo. So hopefully you have all your tempos straight now. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Please tell people about the channel, Dan Heisman Chess. And if you'd like to like the video, that's great too, or subscribe. All those things are great. We'll see you next time. Bye.